Um, thank you. Um, well, as um, Kate said, I work alongside Kate um, as professional development and practice coordinator um, for CIFA based in Scotland. Um, and although this was a fairly new post which started last year, CIFA has been very active in Scotland. Um, it has a very, very active um, Scottish group committee. Um, Petter, the chair of that committee, is here today. Um, and the Scottish group committee has had quite a long history of um, providing training for the sector um, through um, specific training workshops. It's usually about three or four a year. And I think those have been really useful for the profession um, to, to access um, quite cheap training in, in the scheme of things. Um, so um, these training workshops have really raised, you know, range from public speaking to asbestos awareness training. They're very varied, but they're, they're designed to try and Fit, fill gaps within um, the professional sector, perhaps um, sort of training that the professional sector is looking for um, in that way. But the sort of aims of our post or this post was to support a series of training workshops um, for the sector within the current financial year. But we were also tasked um, with completing an assessment of skill gaps, losses uh, and training provision in Scotland because there wasn't really a, a baseline for what was going on in Scotland. Um, and this piece of research was um, funded by Historic Environment Scotland uh, in support of AIM 5 of Scotland's archaeology strategy, which looks at skills and innovation. Uh, CIFA is the lead body for AIM 5, and part of the strategy delivery plan was to assess um, any skill gaps, losses within professional archaeology, as well as research and document um, current training uh, provision that's, that's currently ta uh, taking place. Um, the project also aimed to sort of explore potential or possible future initiatives that could help meet sector-wide challenges with the ultimate aim um, of, and I quote from the delivery plan of the archaeology strategy, um, to define gaps and learning opportunities needed to supply suitable skilled archaeologists. And that's come up quite a bit already in the talks this morning. It's about looking to the future and making sure we are a profession fit for the future. So um, the initial results um, looked at desk space um, resources, such as the archaeology uh, labour market um, intelligent report profiling the profession, um, the heritage market survey, both produced by Landwood um, Research Limited. Kenny is here somewhere um, at the back there. Hey. Um, and it also looked at two reports um, detailed on archaeology um, specialists um, and skill requirements of built heritage and garden history, again by Landward, produced by Landward. And those reports are all on their website, so I urge you to have a look at them because they're really good. Um, and the research was also informed by the CIFA Scottish membership surveys, which includes questions on training. What sort of training are you looking for CIFA to deliver in Scotland? What sort of training themes do you feel are, are not currently being delivered and that we could help with? Um, and this desk space review identified there are some real common themes um, that were coming through. But the biggest theme I think that was coming through is we, we all, I think, know is about it's about basic practical field skills. And it was one of the most commonly cited um, sort of skills deficit within our workforce, particularly for um, early entrant archaeologists um, coming coming into our profession. But there was also reported skill loss in death space assessments, post-excavation skill and specialisms, things like building survey um, or, and garden history. Garden history is not taught at degree level, but it's still quite an important component of the work that, that we do. Um, other skill gaps like project management were cited, um, some of the soft skills um, needed to supervise, to manage people. Um, again, these are not skills that are developed um, either at university or in the sort of early years of an archaeology um, profession, archaeological profession. So again, these are skills that we, we need to sort of start developing um, as a profession. Um, and although all of these sources, all of these desk space sources were really useful at starting along this process for this project, um, what we did identify is that they didn't really tell us what was happening in Scotland. Um, it gave a UK-wide picture, and as most of us know in this room, Scotland is different from the rest of the UK. We are a different workforce, we're a different profession. Um, we're probably a bit more connected than other parts of the UK, 
Um, but we, we also, given the sort of landscape that we work in, we also we have different concentrations of professionals working in, in, in sort of different areas, which I'll, I'll come on to. So we followed up the desk space um, element of this project by consultation with the sector. Um, so I went out and I've um, spoken to quite a few people in this room, either in person or, or via phone, um, to ask about skill gaps, losses, and what training provision is taking place at the moment. Um, you know, and it's a huge thank you to those of you who have spoken to me um, so far. Um, and I think there was a general concern by quite a few, um, quite a few individuals that I spoke to about the capacity of Scotland's archaeological workforce to meet upcoming infrastructure projects and other developments that are running alongside um, those infrastructure projects. Um, Scotland has a smaller pool of staff to draw upon, and I think the Aberdeen Bypass project was a really interesting case in point. It drained a lot of archaeologists from other working in other areas of Scotland, and I think it put a lot of strain um, on our workforce in Scotland by taking up um, so many people working on that project. So we, we, we potentially don't have enough archaeologists in Scotland to deliver some of the upcoming uh, development projects that are, that, that are upcoming. Um, talking directly to people, um, similar themes came up um, that had been identified in the desk base element of this project. Um, there are, with basic, um, there's great concern that a lot of early entrant archaeologists don't have those basic field skills um, to, to come out and work out on site with people. Um, they don't have the required practical skills to get started on sky, site, and it's a challenge for field staff to do that active training while also trying to complete projects. So it can put a lot of stress and strain on projects within the budgets, tight budgets that we're working on, to also be working with um, archaeologists that don't have the sort of required skills and experience to get the job done. Um, again, there was the issue of lack of soft skills, i.e. project management, people management, supervisor levels. Again, these are skills that traditionally haven't been taught formally, I think, in archaeology and heritage. Um, and I think things like people management, they're such a crucial element to being able to get a job done well with a team of people. And yet it's not something that in the past has been invested in. Um, there's issues with recruitment. Um, some units are finding it hard to, um, to recruit supervisors. Um, and there were several reasons potentially for this. There's potentially a gap of um, archaeologists who left during the early years of the recession. There's a sort of gap in our workforce of that sort of age demographic. Um, but also, again, we're, we're, they've soft skills in communication aren't being developed um, for early entrance archaeologists for moving on to that sort of next level. Um, there's also some units are finding it hard to um, to hire project managers. Other units are finding it very easy to hire project managers. Um, and some units are adapting the way that they're hiring people. So they are offering competitive contracts at more competitive pay. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, that, that is, that's a really good thing for our profession if wages are going up um, and um, perhaps training provision is going up. It's you know, a sort of added perk of, of, of why, why do you come work with us? Um, the also the issue of um, access to training and access to the right training um, has been an issue. It was really interesting to see how different commercial units deliver training plans and programmes for their staff. Some do it in a really structured um, and tailored way. So um, if a staff member is interested in getting to the next step in that career, units will put them on that pathway of training in order for them to reach that next step in that career. Other um, units still have a more reactive way of delivering training. So for example, if an individual needs a particular um, qualification or um, a particular experience to work on a specific project, then they will, um, they will put someone on a training course without a, perhaps a clear strategy for their 
organization as a whole. So that was really interesting, the range of tra um, training and delivery um, without, within the, all the units. Specific issues, again, like issues like environmental sampling came out. Um, th these are, I mean, I think there's some really good themes that came out of this study that can help inform the training workshops for CIFA next year. But even the idea of how do we sample out on site? How are we going out on an excavation and getting environmental sampling and things like that? That was uh, a thing that a lot of, um, or an aspect that quite a few ar field archaeologists aren't, uh, still need training and experience in things like that. Um, but I think what was really lovely about this process was that the sector is reacting to some of these pressures and these issues. And there are some excellent training examples that are going on in Scotland at the moment. Um, one unit has taken a really strategic approach to training by producing uh, training resources for all staff to use. So not only is this taking the pressure off field staff um, to um, deliver individual training um, on individual projects, they, they now have a sort of suite of training resources that each, um, all of their staff can use and utilise out on site. Um, and it, it's also promoting a more um, coherent approach to training. So everyone is getting the same standard of training, the same getting taught in the same way. And as our units go larger, they start to work in other areas of the UK, that um, sort of strategic approach to training is really important to make sure that people in Edinburgh are being trained in the same way down in Southampton. It's, um, it's good for our profession. Another unit has started um, supporting and self-financing traineeships. Um, a, trainee, um, a unit is um, delivering a year-long paid traineeship, which will give the individual experience in all aspects of working um, for a commercial unit. Um, and they hope that that trainee will stay with them and that they feel it's a great way to develop a staff member they know will um, be an asset to their organisation. But it's not a requirement. They also see that individual as being fit for our sector and fit um, to, to work with other, within other organisations. Um, that same unit also uses um, some practical excavations like community archaeology excavations to give students experience of practical archaeology. One thing that's becoming apparent is that it's expensive for students to go and develop practical experience throughout their degree. And that unit is utilising um, opportunities like community excavations to give students cost-effective practical experience of working with commercial archaeologists. Um, and I think that's a, an area that a lot of people in this room could support and develop further, actually. Um, so with this, um, we, it was really, as I say, it was really useful to sort of talk directly to people and hear straight from them directly what is going on. Um, and I think it's kind of feeding into, oh crikey, um, it's kind of feeding into some short-term and long-term actions that we could all be taking as a profession. So I think we really need to rethink in, um, how we resource and deliver training in Scotland. Um, this <coughs> photograph here shows um, a training workshop taking place at a University Highland and Islands outpost centre in the west of Scotland. And um, I think we as a profession should be utilising these sorts of centres more. As digital platforms get better, as connectivity throughout Scotland gets better, there is no reason why people in Orkney can't be delivering training to people in Ardemirkin. Well, they can. That's the a UHI outpost there. But looking at what platforms are existing and how we can utilise um, these advancements. Um, develop more partnership working. Are there shared training opportunities between units that could be taking place? If one unit is spending money on uh, delivering training for their staff, is there an opportunity for other units to take part in that um, training in that way? Um, and perhaps support a more structured and strategic approach to training. Look at our profession as a whole. What skills are we missing as a profession to, to keep us fit for the future? Um, and long-term actions. Um, these have all come up already, but do we want to look at supported traineeships, apprenticeships, a year-long college course? I work on uh, an employability scheme called Canal College for Scottish Waterways Trust. 
and we do three weeks of archaeology with them, um, with Archaeology Scotland. Um, and they, they, some of the individuals that take part in that project are really keen to take, go on to do archaeology. And a year-long college course would be perfect for them. They would really flourish in such an activity. But I do think we need a feasibility study or do some feasibility work on to see which of these options are suitable for us to take forward. Um, we don't have a clear idea of costing for some of these projects. Um, we don't have a clear idea of where money could be to support some of these initiatives at a sort of wider scale. Um, but I do think we do need to start maybe, you know, exploring these options because we are already delivering some of these aspects within some areas of our sector. But I think um, more could just start to be done, really. Um, so that's a very rapid um, run through some of the results that we've looked at. Um, and just a huge thank you to everyone who's spoken to me so far um, and also HES for funding the post in the first place. Thank you.